The next speaker is Franco, is a professor of the history of science at the University of Bergamo in Italy. Has been working extensively on early modern physics, focusing especially on optics. Uh, with work produced on Newton, on Hobbes particularly, is involved into the team who is producing the critical edition of uh, Hobbes' works, and is also published on Newton's theory of light and many other topics. Is also one of the person who takes care of Galileana, the international journal of the Museo Galileo devoted to Galilean studies, and is the author, together with uh, Massimo Buccantini and Michele Camerota, of a recent book, very, very nice book, that you will be uh, able to read in English soon, because it will be published by Harvard University Press. But, <laughs> so that, that says I invite Franco to, take the, the, to, to present his paper. The title is Conforme alle posizioni dei Pitagorici e del Copernico, Galileo's Cosmological Views from the Siderius Nuncius to the letters on sunspots. Prego, Franco. Thank you. In my paper, I would like to look at Galileo's position towards the Copernican system in the period between the publication of Siderius Nuncius and the letters on sunspots. In the final part, I also intend to show that one of the main reasons for Galileo's decision to give up his project of an expanded edition of the Siderius was the discovery of sunspots. But before proceeding with the, this analysis, it's worth highlighting that the Copernican question is a thread which runs through Galileo's entire research. Copernicanism is one of the elements, perhaps the most crucial, of Galileo's project to establish a new science that could unify and explain both celestial and terrestrial phenomena. Therefore, it's misleading to separate, as often happens, Galileo's research on motion that would characterize nearly all his time spent in Padua from his astronomical studies, which coincided with the publication of the Siderius. We could, of course, use the succinct description by Maurice Clavelin that Galileo's Copernicanism prior to the Siderius was a silent Copernicanism, namely still lacking the passionate commitment to the Copernican theory which he would publicly display after his extraordinary astronomical discoveries. It's undeniable, however, as various studies have shown, have shown that from the start Galileo's new concept of motion was closely connected to the new Copernican cosmology. Consequently, when Galileo in his famous letter to Kepler, dated the 4th of August, 1597, declared himself to be a follower of the heliocentric theory, it was not because he was just a Copernican sympathizer. In that letter, Galileo described Copernicus as our master and said that because of the Copernican hypothesis, he had discovered the causes of many natural effects which are doubtless inexplicable by the current hypothesis. Galileo also said that he had written many reasons and refutations of the counter argument. As Massimo Buccantini has shown, he was referring to the argument against the motion of the earth proposed by Tycho, <coughs> Tycho Brahe in the debate with the Copernican Christoph Rothman, included in the 1596 publication of Epistolae Astronomiche, which is a significant demonstration that Galileo considered the cosmology and the mechanics closely connected during his time in Padua. He was well aware that in order to replace Aristotle's theory of motion with a new concept of motion, it was necessary to defend the hypothesis of motion of the earth from accusation of absurdity. We can find more evidence for Galileo's attraction to the Copernican hypothesis in his 1604 research on the Nova. He studied the Nova for a number of years from his first observations in October 1604 with the lesson he gave at Padua University 
in the following December, until at least 1606. He told that the phenomenon could have a decisive role in the question of the Sistema Temundi. Galileo considered that the cause of the phenomenon was due to the rectilinear motion of the nova <coughs> and that it had its origin in the terrestrial exhalations illuminated by the sun. In a letter dated January 1605 to an unknown correspondent, Galileo expressed his intention of writing a treatise on the subject and indicated as a result he expected great consequences and conclusions. He did not specify what these consequences and the conclusion would be. However, from the annotations to Brahe's Progiminasmata, written by Galileo in the period between 1604 and 1607, we can try to imagine what he was thinking. In one of these annotations, Galileo reported the opinion of astronomer Elias Camerarius, who also supported the rectilinear motion of the 1572 Nova. Camerarius' thesis has been refuted by Brahe, but Galileo noted that Camerarius' opinion could be correct, provided that it, it acknowledged the annual motion of the Earth. Confirming the cosmological value ascribed by Galileo to the appearance of the Nova, there is another annotation where Galileo transcribed a well-known passage from Seneca's Naturales Questiones, in which the Stoic philosopher had highlighted how, through the examinations of comets, one could infer a possible motion of the Earth around its axis. For Galileo, therefore, the appearance of unpredicted phenomena, such as comets or novae, could offer important clues for determining the possibility of the terrestrial motion. We know that Galileo, Galileo's research on the novae was inconclusive, but it does show its constant commitment to the Copernican question. So, if we consider that for Galileo, the opinion of the Pythagoreans and of Copernicus about the motion and the location of the Earth, as he wrote to Jacopo Mazzoni in May 1597, was much more probable than the other one of Aristotle and Ptolemy, I can now move on the question of Copernicanism in the Siderius and in the letters on sunspots. It's no easy to give credence to the idea that in the Siderius, Galileo did not explicitly declare himself in favor of Copernicanism. In fact, we can say that the opposite is true, namely that in the Siderius, we have the first declaration, public and explicit, of Galileo's cosmological beliefs in favor of Copernican system. Already in his dedicatory letter to Cosimo II, while explaining to the Grand Duke of Tuscany the importance of the four satellites, Galileo emphasizes that these four stars make their journeys and orbits with a marvelous speed around the star of Jupiter, the most noble of them all, with mutually different motions, like children of the same family, while meanwhile, all together, in mutual harmony, complete the great revolutions every 12 years about the center of the world, that's about the sun itself. Then, in the first pages of the Siderius, in Galileo's list of great things offered by in his short treatise for inspection and contemplation by every explorer of nature, when speaking about the discovery that greatly exceeds all admiration, he emphasizes once again that this Satellites like Venus and Mercury around the Sun have their periods around a certain star notable among the number of known ones, and no precede, no follow him, never digressing from him beyond certain limits. This comparison with Venus and Mercury may seem ambiguous, but it's not if we bear in mind what Galileo wrote to Belisario Vinta, Medici secretary, in January 1610. I have discovered four new planets and I have observed their proper and particular motions, different among, among each other and from all the other motions of the stars, 
and these new planets move around another very large star, not otherwise than Venus and Mercury, and by chance the other known planets as well move around the Sun. The discovery of satellites of Jupiter, Jupiter, Jupiter sorry, also demonstrated that the motion of celestial bodies could have centers other than the heart. One of the arguments against the Copernican theory was how there could be two centers of rotation in the universe. Galileo's response was very clear. We have an excellent and splendid argument for taking away the scruple of those who, while tolerating with equanimity the revolution of planets around the sun in the Copernican system, are so disturbed by the attendance of one moon around the hut with the two together complete the annual orb around the sun, they, that they conclude that this constitution of universe must be overturned as impossible. For, we have, uh, we, for here we have not only one planet revolving around another while both run through a great circle around the sun, but our vision offer us four stars wandering around Jupiter like the moon around the Earth. With all together with Jupiter travels a great circle around the Sun in the space of 12 years. According to Galileo, the discovery of Jupiter's satellites removed an important objection to the Copernica theory, as they demonstrated that our moon could revolve around a moving Earth. It should also be noted that in the manuscript of the Siderius, in a passage with what, <clears throat> that was omitted in the publication when Galileo was referring to the Copernican system, he added, which I consider the closest to the truth. The passages quoted so far are well known and are all about the conclusions which Galileo makes from the satellites of Jupiter. But there is another less known passage, or perhaps less quoted, though equally important, as Galileo makes a statement that it's fairly Copernican in a context where the reference to the motion of the Earth was not necessary. It's when Galileo, in order to illustrate more clearly the relationship and the similarity between the Moon and the Earth, explains that the moon and that illuminate each other based on the light they receive from the sun which they then reflect. He states, let these few things said here about this mother suffice. We will say more in our system of the world, where with very many arguments and experiments, a very strong reflection of solar light from the earth is demonstrated to those who claim that the art is to be excluded from the dance of the stars, especially because she is devoid of motion and light. For we will demonstrate that she is movable and surpasses the moon in brightness. Obviously, with the celestial discoveries described in the Siderius, Galileo did not have unquestionable proof of the truth of the heliocentric system. He was nonetheless convinced that his discovery were crucial elements in support of the validity of the Copernican system. His, discovery, his discoveries were also dismantling the traditional belief that there was an essential difference between celestial bodies such as the moon and the terrestrial ones. The existence of mountains on the moon demonstrated that there was no such difference as the moon was made of the same matter as the earth. So it's no surprising that Galileo would announce in the Siderius his intention to writing his own system of the world, where he would provide an overall view to explain the truth of Copernicanism. The Copernican implications of the Siderius were immediately evident to his contemporaries, and not only to those who shared Galileo's Copernican beliefs, such as Kepler or his pupil, Benedetto Castell. We have the important testimony of a person who was being largely forgotten in Galilean's historiography, but who was quite well known at the time. The high prelate Bonifacio Vannozzi from Pistoia, apostolic protonotary and the future secretary to Pope Paul V, 
and who attended the court of Cosimo II. Between August and September 1610, Bannozzi wrote from Florence to a fellow citizen, magistrate and scholar, and scholar Girolamo Baldinotti. Regarding Galileo, I am of one mind with you, and any good theologian will laugh at those who maintain that the earth really moves and the, and the sun stands still. Such things have been said on other occasions as hypotheses, not as truth. To say that the moon is earth-like with valleys and hills is as much as to say that there are flocks and that graze deer and cowherds who cultivate it. We must stand by the church, which is the enemy of the anything new, according to the teachings of St. Paul. These are the thoughts from brilliant minds, but they are dangerous, and I prefer to be a theosophist rather than a philosopher. But Nazi's position was not an isolated one. As we can see from the much better known case of the Aristotelian Ludovico delle Colombe, who wrote a piece at the end of 1610 or early 1611 with the title of Contro il moto della terra, against the motion of the earth, where he listed several biblical passages against the Copernican system. Although this work was never formally published, it's well known that the manuscript was widely circulated in, and that Galileo himself read it and wrote notes on it. In early 1611, Francesco Sizzi published a small treatise entitled Di Anoia Astronomica Optica Physica, where with arguments taken from the Bible, he criticized the astronomical discoveries of Galileo. Sizzi disputed the existence of Jupiter satellites, citing the authority of the Bible about the number of existing planets. But Sizzi also criticized the Copernican system. He criticized the new school of astronomers, i.e. the Copernicans, who maintain that the Earth does not stand still, but is endowed with movement, and that all the planets move around the Sun. In another passage, Sizzi ascribed explicitly to Galileo the thesis of the movement of the Earth. The Earth is endowed with the movement, as the author of Siderius Nuncius puts it, a sentence that shows without doubt that Sizzi had understood, understood the Copernican implications of Siderius very well. These statements not only demonstrate that Galileo was considered a Copernican, but also that the Copernicanism was thought to be opposite both the traditional system of the world and the theological principles. They are at the core of the conflict between science and religion, which a few years later would put Galileo in opposition to the Church of Rome. By the end of 1610, however, no one could doubt Galileo's addition to the Copernican system. Communicating to Christopher, Shai, sorry, Christopher Claudius, the chief mathematician of the Collegio Romano, his discovery of the faces of Venus Galileo wrote, now, sir, we can rest assured that Venus goes around the sun, doubtless the center of the revolutions of all planets. We are certain that the planets are intrinsically dark and only shine by being illuminated by the sun, and that the planetary system is surely different from what is commonly believed. The faces of Venus similar to those of the moon, could not correspond with Aristotelian Ptolemaic astronomy, because their observation showed that the planet revolved around the sun. The phenomenon was compatible not only with the Copernican system, but also with the Tychonic. But in Galileo's opinion, the Tychonic system was only a mathematical compromise with no physical justification. According to Galileo, the phenomenon was a further confirmation of the validity of Copernicanism. The discovery of the faces of Venus, together with the observation of Saturn's peculiar shape, 
concluded a cycle of extraordinary discoveries which Galileo started in the fall of 1609. It was also in order to give information of these new discoveries that he had decided to publish a new edition of Desiderius. He had had this idea just a week after publication of Desiderius, since the 550 copies of the book as he wrote to Belisario Vinta on 19 of March 1610 had immediately been snapped up. Galileo was thinking about a new expanded edition enhanced with new celestial observations and beautiful images of the entire moon cycle and with many celestial images with all stars that really exist. The new edition would be written in vernacular and not in Latin like the first one. By June, the scope of the project had increased even more. The book was going to include all the objections and doubts from his opponents, together with Galileo's answers, so that no one may add that. In the meantime, having made improvement to his telescope, he was hoping to have other discoveries to report. At the end of July, Galileo confided in Vinta as to the amazing configuration of Saturn and asked him not to divulge the news until I will publish it myself in the work I'm going to reprint, i.e. Desiderius. By August, though, Galileo's project had become too complicated. Besides the Orc affair, his friend Alessandro Sartini, who was uh, going to manage the reprinting in Florence, informed Galileo that Francesco Sitz was writing a treatise against his discoveries. In addition, in his new work, Galileo intended to answer the doubts raised by Kepler in his dissertatio that could well be used by his opponents. In addition, Galileo intended to include a letter by Kepler and another piece, both against Ork. In short, as time went by, the original project was changing more and more, so much so that the expanded reprint of the Sidereus was turning in, into another book altogether with a structure that was totally different. This resulted in Galileo's gradually abandoning the project to the point where even the constant urging by Federico Cesi, founder of the Academia del Lincei and sponsor of Galileo in Rome, fell on deaf ears. One of the causes that led Galileo to abandon the Siderius reprinting project was undoubtedly the publication in 1611 of Kepler's Dioptrice. In its preface, Kepler had made known both the discovery of Saturn's peculiar shape and that of the faces of Venus, thus depri depriving the Siderius reprint of that sense of novelty that such discoveries would have brought. In the meantime, in the summer of 1611, Galileo was involved in a controversy with several Aristotelian philosophers close to the Medici court about the phenomena of condensation and rarefaction of fluids. So, in May 1612, he published his Discorso Intorno alle cose che stanno in sull'acqua, Discourse on Floating Bodies. While writing his discourse, Galileo was also responding to Welser and Christoph Scheiner's queries on the discovery of sunspots. And it was especially this new discovery that convinced Galileo of the need to write another book, one entirely devoted to the sun, in order to highlight the value of this new and extraordinary telescopic observation. It's important to note, however, that in order to show his constant commitment to the astronomical discoveries, in the introduction, introduction to the discourse, Galileo presented his calculation of the periods of Jupiter's satellites, and in the second edition of the discourse, published in the fall of 1612, he gave for the first time his explanation of sunspots. Galileo published they published the book on sunspots in March 1613, in the aftermath of the controversy with Christopher Scheiner about the priority of the discovery and about the interpretation of the nature of the phenomenon. 
the book which became famous as Letters on Sunspots had a significant title, Historia e Dimostrazioni Intorno alle, loro, alle Macchie Solari e Loro Accidenti, History and Demonstrations Concerning Sunspots and Their Properties. Not only a history book then, or a sample reporting of, a, of a phenomena as was Desiderius, but also a book of demonstration, that's of a philosophy, of necessary and conclusive reasons that have the task of explaining the two constitutions of the universe, because according to Galileo, this constitution exists, it, exi it exists in a way that is unique, real, true, and impossible to be otherwise. Galileo had no doubts. The true constitution of the universe was the Copernican one. In his first letter, already Galileo emphasized all the phases of Venus which he had discovered almost two years ago led with absolute necessity to the conclusion, one consistent with the positions of the Pythagoreans and of Copernicus, that its revolution is about the sun, around which, as the center of the revolutions, all other planets run. And in the third letter, Galileo stated with renewed energy that for the most expert in the science of astronomy, it was enough to have understood, understood what Copernico, Copernicus writes in Revolutions to assure to himself of the revolution of Venus about the Sun and of the truth of, of the rest of his system. In the debate with Shiner, Galileo argued that sunspots were clouds, similar to terrestrial clouds that form a breakup constantly generating irregular movements, and as such, they were different from the satellites of Jupiter, which are true and real stars, permanent and perpetual, and have most regular motion and fixed periods. For Galileo, the sunspots have a single great common and orderly motion with which they travel across the body of the sun in uniform fashion and in parallel lines. We are informed, writes Galileo, by the particular characteristics of this motion first, that the body of the sun is absolutely spherical, and second, that it moves of itself and about its own center, carrying the sad spots with it in parallel circles, and finishing an entire cycle in about one lunar month with a revolution similar to that of the orbs of the planet. To explain the rotation movement of the sun about its own center, Galileo used a physical argument. Every bodies are indifferent to horizontal motion, to which they have neither inclination, because it's not toward the center of the heart, nor evasion, because it's not away from the same center. And therefore, with all the external impediments removed, every body on the spherical surface concentric to the earth will be indifferent to rest and to movement towards any part of the horizon, and it will remain in the state in which it has been put. So Galileo pointed out the sun, a body of a spherical shape, suspended and balanced around its own center, has neither an intrinsic aversion nor an external impediment to such a rotation. It was the first time that Galileo formulated the, his principle of inertia in a published work, also the example of a ship which would later become famous in the dialogue on the two chief world system that before Eileen uh, uh, quoted. And this was not in a treatise on mechanics, but in an astronomical work. In the letters on sunspots, therefore, Galileo was not only declaring publicly his explicit and definitive addition to the physical reality of Copernican cosmology, but he was also establishing an, an inseparable connection between cosmology and mechanics, introducing a natural philosophy which was different and alternative compared to the traditional one. All elements 
therefore, that make letters on sunspots the first text of Galilean philosophy, a work that were Galileo's great challenge of founding a new science of motion with the new constitution of the universe find its first and mature form of application. It's not surprising, therefore, that at the end of 1613, just after the publication of the letters on sunspots, Copernicanism became an important question in the public debate, forcing Galileo to defend himself and the Copernican system not only from philosophical and astronomical criticism, but also from tools that call into question the theological plausibility of Copernicanism. Thank you very much. In the Siderius, there is no an explanation of the, of the eclipses uh, of, of the moon. Galileo explained only the fact that uh, the moon and the earth have a reflection each other from the, from the light from uh, the, the sun. And uh, this is no an argument to uh, maintain that uh, the earth is not uh, illuminated. It's dark. This is the only argument in the uh, Siderius Nutrius. I don't know if in the dialogue there is an, uh, an explanation of the, the, the eclipses of, of, the, of the moon. I, I don't remember. I, 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 I don't think. This is, a, this is not a, 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 a question. It was certainly paying lots of attention to the eclipses of the Jupiter moons because that was uh, instrumental to find a solution to the quest for longitude. That has been something ah, yes. that uh, Galileo paid a few years of his life to establish the periods and the eclipses or occultations of the satellites of Jupiter. Yes. Because he was confident that being able to solve the problem, the dramatic problem of making the point of longitude at sea. So that, that is something that he was very familiar with. And he wrote tables of the occultations um, I mean, pretty precise tables compared to the <laughs> ways in which it could work. And he offered this solution to the Spain and then to the Dutch countries, uh, hoping that he would have like, been able to get money from, from that. Sorry, I was not. <laughs> so that ju just, just to mention something that has to do with eclipses of uh, satellites compared to, to the sun. Question. The question is if there is any connection between the observation of the sunspots and the blindness that is very... No, 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 because there, is a, um, there was a method to observe the, the sunspots. It's with the um, uh, casting the, uh, the light of the, the, the sun. That's the instrument. <laughs> uh, okay. On uh, a paper. Uh, in this way, there's no problem for, for, the, for the eyes. This is a method uh, uh, elaborated by Castelli, and, and um, it's a very useful uh, method to avoid the blindness. Is a painter's method? Yes, yes. Is a camera obscura? Yes, it's uh, another form of a camera obscura, I think. Okay, the question is about the observation uh, by Tycho Brahe uh, against the fact that it's impossible to observe the parallax phenomenon. Okay, uh, according to Galileo, uh, the hybrid system of Tycho, Tycho Brahe, is uh, just uh, a, a way to, uh, to furnish an uh, optical uh, justification of the, uh, of the world. Mm? Okay. And uh, for Galileo, it's, 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 it's impossible to follow this, uh, this way to explain phenomena. And uh, mm, concerning the fact that it's possible to observe the parallax, is it because Galileo uh, knew perfectly that uh, until with the, uh, sorry, uh, to with the telescope, it's impossible to observe the parallax phenomena. And it's not a problem because uh, it's a, a physical reason the choice of Galileo to uh, maintain the Copernican system. Because uh, it's the only one uh, system that 
can explain, for instance, the difference, the, in the inexistence uh, between the celestial world and the terrestrial world. In the Tychonic system, for instance, there is a rigid separation bit between the celestial world and the terrestrial world. In this way, it's not impossible to justify the corruptibility of the, the sky, the, uh, the nature uh, of, of the moon with the mountains similar to the heart, and, and etc. Cetera, and cetera. This is as the, the first uh, considerations uh, by Galileo against the Tychonic or Tychonic system. 